not wish to, t to talk to her or hear her name. Fading. And every cell in my body fought to live. What more could you possibly want to take from this family? Heartbreaking news about the murder of a girl from Kenosha. Police say her father confessed to planning to kill her, and the girl's grandfather is devastated. He spoke exclusively with Shannon Sims tonight. Mike Russell Rose. Senior is mourning the loss of his granddaughter and facing the possibility of losing his son, too. He didn't want to appear on camera, but he's deeply upset and shocked by the accusations against his son, Russell. Judith Serenity Rose died tragically. Police say her father threw her onto a concrete driveway, leading to her death. Couldn't believe this. It's like a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. You know, I mean, that is, that's not my son doing that. I don't know. What is that? Wearing a suicide vest and with bandages on his arms and face, Russell Rose Jr. sat silently in court. The judge ordered him not to have any contact with Serenity's mother. I wish to, to talk to her or hear her name. According to the criminal complaint, Rose Jr. had been arguing with Serenity's mother and admitted he intended to kill the girl. He claimed he wanted to rid her of the evil inside her and destroy what he created. Russell Sr. says he is shocked by his son's actions. Nobody in my family ever killed anybody like this. My son. And to do this here to his own flesh and blood, I mean, that's, that's like... I mean, I'm just holding the words I got to say because I... Meanwhile, a memorial of stuffed animals and balloons is growing outside Serenity's apartment, honoring the memory of an innocent baby. It was an emotional day in a Johnson County courtroom as two rape victims confronted their attacker. Many in the courtroom were in tears as they listened to the testimony. These two victims have waited a year and a half for this moment. One of the victims was raped and beaten in her own apartment, while the second victim, though not raped, was severely beaten during an attempted assault. The assistant district attorney handling the case described it as the most brutal and savage rape and assault the town has ever seen. During the afternoon sentencing, Jesse Akins pleaded guilty and did not testify in his defense. His lawyer explained that Jesse was on cocaine at the time and expressed his remorse for the pain he caused the victims and their families. Both victims are relieved that Akins is finally going to prison. One victim told the judge that Akins should get 30 years for the more than 30 minutes he held her down, raped her, and beat her, leaving her in a pool of blood. That night I felt myself fading, and every cell in my body fought to live. That fight was bigger than the pain, bigger than the fear. It's just a pure will to survive. To remember those words of you threatening to come back and finish what you started if we were to ever turn you in. And for us to be here and for you to be there is the one of the greatest feelings I will ever know. After that powerful testimony, the judge praised the two victims for their strength and courage. He then sentenced Jesse Akins to 27 and a half years in prison. At a sentencing hearing in Macomb County, the three men convicted of killing Salaka learned their punishment. One year and four months after Basil Salaka was murdered in cold blood, his killers were sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Salaka, who owned the popular Moonlight Party store in Clinton Township, was gunned down when Jamar Robinson, Darius Diaz Gaskin, and Kenneth Hill came to his store with the intent to rob and kill him. All three men were found guilty of first-degree murder, armed robbery, and other charges. Before sentencing, Salaka's family had the opportunity to address the killers in court. His two daughters were too overwhelmed to speak and had a prosecutor read their prepared statements aloud. However, Salaka's sister, Vivian, chose to speak directly to the men who took her brother's life. To the killers who murdered my brother in cold blood, I say this to you. You're an absolute disgrace to the human race. I hope that while you spent the rest of your life in prison, you actually reflect on the awful decisions you've made in your life. I hope you are haunted and reminded every day by the, all the ill choices you have made. You have the blood of a loving father, 
husband, son, and brother on your hands. When it was time for the defendants to speak, all three expressed remorse and took responsibility for their actions. However, Judge Mary Shannon was not convinced. She was particularly troubled by Joe Moore Robinson. At an earlier hearing, Robinson had turned to Salaka's sister and said, it ain't over, before cursing at her. The judge demanded an explanation for his behavior. What more could you possibly want to take from this family, yet insult them and threaten them and say, this ain't over yet? What does that mean? Fill us in, because you know what? I'm a little worried for them. Oh, I know I wasn't talking to them. I know for a fact I wasn't. Well, who were you talking to? I was talking to my family. This they ain't over yet, b I didn't say the B word. You could play the record. You hear it for yourself again. Madam Prosecutor, did I get this wrong? I don't believe so, Judge. And there you are a number of other people in the, in the courtroom that heard Play the recording, Dan. And you know what? If I could give you an extra 10 years, I would, but I can't. A month after popular bartender Eric Brantley was shot and killed in Park Circle, the final suspect was arrested in downtown Charleston. Jamal Green Jr. was taken into custody on unrelated charges. Charleston police caught him attempting to steal a moped that they had set up as bait, equipped with a GPS tracker to alert them if anyone tried to move it. Jamal Green appeared in bond court for the murder of Eric Brantley. Brantley's mother spoke about how much her son was loved. Eric was not just a bartender, he was a good man. He was a well-known musician in Charleston. He repaired vintage motorcycles. He was intelligent, a deep thinker, had a great sense of humor, was a kind and compassionate person. Throughout the statement, Green grinned, rocked back and forth, and shook his head. When Brantley's mother spoke about Eric's memorial service, Green interrupted her. 500 people attended his memorial service, many traveling thousands of miles to honor him. How many people will attend a memorial service for a coward like you? And he continued speaking while she went on with her statement. The judge told Green that his outburst would result in a contempt of court charge and warned him not to speak again. Make sure that you understand that, and that you can take your composure while she's speaking. At the end, Brantley's mother assured Green that they would attend every future hearing. If we have anything to say about it, you will rot in jail or in hell. Green was not granted a bond for the murder or armed robbery charges. However, he was given a $150,000 bond for the weapons charge. Three people have been charged with murder following a homicide in Greenville County. A grieving sister cried out in court as one of the suspects made their first appearance. Take her out. 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 As you can imagine, that family has every right to be upset seeing the person accused of killing their loved one. The grieving sister of 25-year-old Eddie Mike Thomas, Candace Robinson, was carried out of the courtroom. After coming face-to-face -face with the accused killer, he's one of three people charged in the case. Thomas's family says it's been a tough journey waiting for justice. On the morning of September 6, 2018, Greenville County deputies found Thomas shot to death on Mill Street and Taylor's. A little over eight months later, authorities announced the arrests of three suspects. The accused murderers are Candace Robinson, who is in jail in Greenville County, and cousins Devasia Talley and Jonathan Talley, who are currently held in Spartanburg County on unrelated charges. The judge denied Robinson's bond in Greenville County, speaking directly to her son's accused killer. Months at two days. With her daughter by her side, the pain was intense in Atosha Thomas Pugh's voice. You could see it as her daughter broke down in court. Eddie Mike Thomas's family came face to face with one of the three suspects accused of shooting him on Mill Street. Candace Robinson is one of the suspects, and deputies discovered Thomas's body in the middle of the road. We lived that Thursday every Thursday. A judge denied the bond for Robinson. Deputies say she and her two cousins, Jonathan and Devasia Talley, lured Thomas into a car the night he died. When he tried to escape, deputies say they each shot him. All three are charged with his murder. Devastate our family. My son was not not a perfect child by no means, but for you to have jumped, he jumped out the car and ran, trying to get away from them, and they shot him. For months, Thomas's family, including his three young children and their mother, lived in uncertainty, not knowing who killed Thomas. Natasha, Thomas's mother, says her son was friends with the Tallies, but she didn't know Robinson. Seeing her in court, Natasha says, was difficult to process. She enjoyed her Christmas. And she enjoyed her New Year's. 
She didn't see, my son did not get to see his first son be born. He was not at his second daughter's first birthday. He won't see nothing. Now that three people are in custody and charged with his murder, Natasha says a weight has been lifted. I feel a, a, a sense of, how can I put it, calmness about it. I do, I, I yeah. There's been a, a cloud that's been moved. But as the dark cloud over her family begins to lift, she says she's still trying to piece together exactly what happened to her son. He told me in a dream, and I believe in dreams, he said, Mama, be still and know, because the dominoes are going to start falling, and they fell yesterday. Prosecutors say they are seeking justice for a family who lost a toddler in a tragic incident more than a year ago. This morning, the 50th District Court in downtown Pontiac held an arraignment for 18-year-old Brees Hankey. She faces serious charges related to the death of a girl last year. Brees Hankey sat quietly in front of a camera, appearing via video link as Judge Rhonda Gross read the charges. You did kill Shamaria Chambers. You're charged with homicide, mass slaughter. You're facing 15 years. The case dates back to late July 2014. The Oakland County Sheriff's Department reports that after a thorough investigation, detectives concluded that Sumeria Chambers' death was no accident. A white Dodge Charger in the driveway of a home served as a rolling memorial for Sumeria Chambers. Deputies say Hanky was Sumeria's cousin and was babysitting her on the night of the incident. Often babysat her as well as her other cousin. Hanky confirmed to the judge that she lives in South Sanford, but her grandmother reportedly told investigators she had been staying with an uncle at a house on North Roselawn. When we tried to verify this information, nobody was home. Additionally, concerns about Hanky's state of mind were revealed in court. Mental health issues were reported, but it does not appear that she is receiving any treatment. Deputies indicated that Hanky had been taking medication for a mental condition, but stopped because she didn't like the way it made her feel. Judge Gross ordered Hanky to resume taking any prescribed medications. The judge also set bond at $250,000 and mandated that Hanky have no contact with minor children if released. A woman has been arrested and charged with killing her own father at an assisted living facility. 36-year-old Chevelle Richards remains in custody with a $500,000 bond. Detectives say she has a prior arrest for battery in Georgia involving a stabbing, and she admitted to them that she had stabbed her father before. Detectives found Chevelle Richards wearing a wig days after killing her 63-year-old father, Johnny Richards. She was located at her son's apartment in Coloran Township. She was posing as his girlfriend, so there was us in a room, and I brought him in, and I said, who is that? And he had to say, it's my mom. Family members say Chevelle frequently asked everyone for money. Detectives say they found evidence related to these requests on her. Car, cell phones, money, credit cards. She's always asking her father for money, um, so we believe it is financially driven. Detectives say family members identified Chevelle after they were shown surveillance video of her in her father's apartment complex. She was the last person seen leaving his apartment, the last time he was seen alive. She had a rag on her left hand, um, and uh, we did have find an injury on her hand. Detectives say Chevelle admitted to stabbing her father on a previous occasion. There was a family dispute of some kind or of a dispute among friends and her dad ended up cut in that incident. Detectives say she did not admit to this killing, but they believe they have enough evidence for an indictment. They are still awaiting the autopsy results. Robert Edinburgh, the father of a boy killed in Cleveland, spoke during the sentencing of Timika Eggleton. Cuyahoga County Common Pleas Court Judge Brendan J. Sheehan sentenced Eggleton to 31 to 35 years to life in prison. Additionally, Eggleton will be required to register as a violent offender. Jeanette Edinburgh, the victim's grandmother, expressed the family's deep pain. I am very hurt. My whole family is hurt. Baby Curtis was a blessing to all of us. My family, my son, Miss Eggleton has really damaged our family. He was the love of all of us. He was a joy to all of us. I have a lot of anger in my heart, but God is working with me on this, she said. I hope Miss Eggleton has time to reflect on what she has done because she took something from us that was a joy. I miss his smiles, I will miss his talks, and I will miss him calling me Nana. <clears throat> 
Sorry, Robert, can you just say your first and last name for the court reporter? Robert Edinburgh. You want me to spell it? Yeah, please. E D I N B U R G H. I'm really not a talkative person. I like keep all my emotions inside. This has been the most difficult thing I ever had to go through. I never thought I'd be in a situation like this. I keep replaying the same moment, June 14th. Every day I wake up, I kissed him on his forehead, told him I would come back to him. Don't cry, I love you. I had to work a double that morning. I didn't expect for me to have a phone call in the next couple of hours saying, hurry up and come back home. He hit his head. Rushed to the hospital. She's sitting in the room, rocking back and forth. Famous statement, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know you're going to blame me for this, but I'm sorry. I try to comfort her and get a hug from her, but it was so cold. Like, without a care in the world. I asked the doctors, did they revive him? They tell me they couldn't do nothing for him. They take him to another room, take the, take the cloth off him. His eyes are still open, still shaking. Blood coming out his nose, I'm holding his hand. His hand get colder and colder while I stand there. I didn't want to leave him again. My nephew had to pull me out of there. I just want to know why. What made you do this? What was the purpose of all this? You had a decision. God gave you a decision to be a mother. God gave me a decision to be a man. I went for three years straight to supervise visits once a week to see my son. For me to have an attachment. I had to let him know that I was never going to abandon him. I knew when he got older, he was going to even look for me and look for my side of the family. I just needed to let him know that I loved him, regardless of where he was at. In the situation that we in, I told her plenty of times, if I couldn't have him the way I wanted to, I should have let him stay in foster care because they loved him way more than they, that she could ever. My experience with my son was great. I just hope that you really give my son justice, because I would. I'm sorry, I should be a little bit more talkative, but this is like a hard statement for me to be. Appreciate you coming down, Robert, and thank you for sharing. Thank you. Murder suspect and gang member Abdul Omar Emanuel, 20, from Rock Hill, South Carolina, has apologized to the family of Michael Giddens, 25. Emanuel shot Giddens to death during a botched drug deal in January 2014. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 
there looking back at you. And please make me smile. Now, now make me cry, please. I've been crying for several years now, so I got to know I'm not trying. You know, I'm not going to say you okay. I'm trying to raise him the best way I know how. He never had a male figure in his life. Never. His dad just came home from jail. The same month, he got arrested. So I'm asking you to please have mercy on him. Thank you very much. All right. Yes, sir, Mr. Emanuel. Oh, man. I'd like to address the kid and the family. I want them to know that they're deeply sorry for their loss. I want them to know that I didn't mean that for none of this to happen. God knows I didn't plead. I want them to know that it was not my intent or did I intentionally mean to harm your son in any possible way that I was kidding. I walked in the midst of the conversation and all I saw was the barrel of a shotgun being pointed towards my, my co-defendant. And I panic. I pray every night and I ask God to forgive me for what I have done. And I'm asking you today to please forgive me. I am not a murderer or a monster like the media make me out to be for Rock Hill City. This has been a very hard on me and my family knowing that all of us are going through this because of me. So I ask you please to forgive me. I wish I could take all of this back. Believe me. When I say this, please forgive me. Mom, please don't blame yourself for the mistakes that I made. I know you gave me everything that I want and you wanted the best for me. I wish at all times you was talking to me, I would have listened to you, and I know I would not be standing here today. So I'm very sorry, and I know you love me with all your heart. I, who please don't follow my footsteps and stay focused in school and keep playing football, and I know I am so sorry I've let you down. Your Honor, I know that I've done wrong, and I didn't mean for any of this to happen. I did not mean for anyone to get hurt. God knows I did, and I wish I could take all this back again. So please, Your Honor, I'm begging you to please forgive me and have mercy on me. To the Gideon's family and to my family, I'm truly and deeply sorry for the loss of your son. And it hurts me every night knowing that I'm in this situation. I'm only 20 years old, you know? I ask that y'all forgive me, even if the court did not forgive me. I ask that knowing y'all forgive me, I'll make it through my sins. Good. Quite a record. Uh, so, I'm going to give you 30 years on the manslaughter, five on the accompanying possession of a weapon during a violent crime, 10 years on the armed robbery consecutive. Five on the pointing and presenting, 20 on the assault and battery, five on the possession of a weapon during that offense, five on each of the conspiracies, and one on the uh, carrying a pistol. Good luck to you. <laughs>
uh, he went and attempted to hide the murder weapon. After the vehicle crashed into a fence, Mr. Robinson ran back to the vehicle and attempted to act like he was rendering aid to those victims. Uh, there was insufficient evidence on that day of the murder to charge Mr. Robinson, so he was released. His family then took him up to Charlotte in an effort to hide him from the police and to hide him from those who were seeking revenge for McCullough and McCrory's murders. Uh, Your Honor, in all the cases that I have personally investigated over the last 12 years, I have not dealt with someone who better defines the term a threat to society. Uh, we believe that this young man unquestionably must be kept off of our streets and away from our citizens uh, throughout the duration of this uh, investigation. Um, the, the other victim of the homicide is Mr. McCrory. Today he's represented by his family. His mom, Stephanie McClinton, and his uncle, Timothy Williams, both wish to speak. All right. And, and Kate, who else wanted to speak? His uncle. His uncle. Would you like to go first? I can. Okay. And you're Mr. Williams? Yes, Mr. Williams. I'm the uncle of McCurry. Um, we just come today uh, to be a force for him, knowing that he has no voice now. Uh, we want the court to know that, that uh, we are in pain. This is the second such uh, tragedy that we've dealt with in, in the last eight months uh, the same way. So we're in pain today and we are asking the court uh, to deny bond uh, because we just don't know what, what to think. Um, him being in the car with them, uh, portraying to be a friend and then shooting them like the way that he did the mother's in pain, you see her today. Uh, we still grieving over things, like I said previous, and now we got to grieve through this, and we just asking that the court just deny bond. On June 23, 2013, in Nashville, Vanderbilt University football player Brandon Vandenberg engaged in inappropriate behavior with an unconscious 21-year-old female student. The jury and the judge will determine the suspect's fate. Before reaching a verdict, the jury must hear all sides of the case regarding the suspect. Number 11 has the paperwork which indicates that you are the fourth person. Are you the fourth person? Yes, Your Honor. Have you reached the verdict? Yes, we have. All right, would you please stand and reach we, the jury, find the defendant, Brandon Vandenberg, count one, aggravated r guilty of aggravated r count two, aggravated r guilty of aggravated r count three, aggravated r guilty of aggravated r count four, aggravated r guilty of aggravated r Count five, aggravated guilty of aggravated. Count six, aggravated battery, guilty of aggravated battery. Count seven, guilt, uh, aggravated battery, guilty of aggravated battery. Count eight, unlawful photography, guilty of unlawful photography. All right, let me ask you this question, number 11. Is that your considered verdict? Yes, Your Honor. All right, please be seated. I'm going to ask each of you, starting with juror number one, if that is your considered verdict. Is that your considered verdict? Yes, Your Honor. Juror number two, is that your considered verdict? Yes, Your Honor. Juror number four, is that your considered verdict? Yes, Your Honor. Juror number five, is that your considered verdict? Yes, Your Honor. Juror number six, is that your considered verdict? Yes, Your Honor. Juror number seven, is that your considered verdict? Yes, Your Honor. Juror number 14, is that your considered verdict? Yes, Your Honor. Juror number 13, is that your considered verdict? Yes, Your Honor. Juror number 12, is that your considered verdict? Yes, Your Honor. Juror number 10, is that your considered verdict? Yes, Your Honor. And juror number nine, is that your considered verdict? Yes, Your Honor. All right, thank you very much. Anything from either side? No, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. All right, thank you. You're excused. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your service. I do want to speak with you very, very briefly because I know you want to get back home. So uh, I'll be down there in just a couple of moments, and I'll only spend a couple of moments with you. Thank you very much. All right, All you're right. excused. <laughs>
please be seated. All right, Mr. Vandenberg, jury having found you guilty on all counts, the court accepts the jury's verdict. Uh, your bond will have to be revoked. We will have a um, sentencing hearing on what date, Madam Clerk? Well, either July 15th or July 29th. All right, whichever one is convenient for all parties. Okay, well, we'll, we'll work out the details. All right? What was the next one? July 15th or July 29th? They're both Fridays. Not available on the 29th. Well, I think we'll come up with. A, a, there are so many parties involved in this. We'll we'll work out a particular date. Thank you all, everybody. Thank you. A person often experiences guilt after doing something improper. Did Brandon feel guilty about his actions or not? Your Honor, I'm grateful that I have the opportunity to convey my thoughts not only to you, Your Honor, but to my family my friends, and Ms. Lackey. I am here before the court saddened, scared, ashamed, and remorseful for the crimes that I've been convicted of. Your Honor and everyone involved, I am sorry. Ms. Lackey, I am deeply sorry. It seems inadequate to try to explain how this all happened. I go over and over this in my mind and try to replay what could have been done to prevent the events of that night. I'm ashamed of myself that I was so irresponsible with alcohol, which led to something tragic. I've worked so hard for so many years to reach my goal of getting a scholarship and playing in the SEC, going to Vanderbilt, and getting a world-class education. My life and the lives of all of those around me including Ms. Lackey, seemed to be a dream at that time. I was living out my dream, and in an instant, it all changed. I didn't know anyone in Nashville, except my mentors on the football team that I had just met, being that I had just moved a few weeks prior from California, over 2,000 miles away. I was an inexperienced drinker, drinker when I arrived at Vanderbilt just a few weeks prior, still not the legal drinking age. I was drinking all that day with my football mentors, then we went to another party and drank, and then to the Tin Roof Bar, having drinks supplied to us. I wanted to be accepted and fit in with my new environment. My family was very far away. My football family was my family. I went out that night with my teammates, Miss Lackey meeting me at the tin roof, doing what we had done before. But instead of having a fun night, it turned into something that spiraled out of control. We were all living a nightmare that I don't wish anyone to go through. My judgment was severely impaired, and I'm sad for every everybody involved. I was very intoxicated that day, consuming nearly 40 alcoholic drinks. Several witnesses said that I was extremely intoxicated, speaking gib gibberish, not making sense. Never could I have imagined this to happen. I did not intend for this to happen or for anyone to be harmed. I caused people harm, including my family and friends. I was raised better than this. I have disappointed many people. I have ruined not only my future because I was drunk and failed to act, but the futures of others. I'm scared because as a young man, I do not know what the future holds for me. I never and could never have imagined that I would be in a situation like I am today. That was not my intention coming out here. I don't know much about the court process other than what I've been in, and I know that I never want to be involved with it again. I've always tried to be the best person I could be, helping those that needed help I volunteered at my Catholic high school. I did mission work. I tutored young children, and I coached football youth teams. But on June the 23rd, 2013, I let everyone down, and many lives were destroyed. After the incident, I told police what I thought might have happened. In my statement, you can see that I did not even know 
Mr. Banks, Mr. Beatty, or Mr. McKenzie, because I had just arrived on campus. I could not identify who did or said what. I did give the police my phone and offered to try and find any potential evidence that was on my phone. Offered to tell Ms. Lackey what I thought had happened. I wanted to talk to Ms. Lackey. I did, told me not to contact her, so I didn't. I tried to assist in any way that I could and not interfere with their investigation. I hope through prayer that I am forgiven and God provides everyone the strength to get through this tragic event. I wish that I could replace the person that I was on June 23rd, 2013 with the person that I am today. The person today does not drink alcohol. My thoughts are clear, I am responsible, and I think of others. I rely on my faith. The man I am today would have had a different outcome. I can be a positive person to others, and I have learned from this devastating event. Once I have served my sentence, I can see myself as a positive role model and teach our youth about my experience. I want to help my younger brothers who are losing their eyesight and will eventually go blind due to a degenerative disorder and be there for them in the future. I'm confident in the future I'll be able to redeem myself. I understand, Your Honor, that you can sentence me to many years in prison. And I pray that you can see that I'm truly sorry for the actions of that night. I'm a good person, and I ask for your mercy when you sentence me. Please, Your Honor, thank you. May God continue to bless you, Miss Lackey, and everybody involved. Everyone has to face the consequences of their actions at some point. The judge also informed Brandon of the outcome of his deeds. As I have said before, this is one of the saddest cases that I have ever encountered in my many, many years in the system here. Uh, but, you know, be that as it may, I still have to just look at the evidence that was presented at trial, all of the uh, motions that were heard, the uh, sentencing hearing, pre-sentence report, the evidence at the sentencing hearing, principles of sentencing, uh, the arguments of counsel, the nature, of the criminal conduct involved here, as well as the enhancement and mitigating factors. As it has been stated previously, uh, with respect to the range of punishment, uh, the court finds that this is a range one case, uh, and the parties have really stipulated to that. So that's not a major area of contention, or well, not an area of contention at all. The court does find that there are enhancement factors in this particular case. Uh, pursuant to TCA 4035-114, one enhancement factor is that the court believes that the victim was particularly vulnerable because of her physical incapacity. Another enhancement factor the court believes is that uh, the victim uh, suffered psychological injuries as a result of this incident. Another factor is the court does believe that the victim, that the defendant, excuse me, is in a position of private trust. It has been pointed out as stated in State v. Kissinger and as the court uh, cited uh, State v. Scott, who, which is actually citing State v. Kissinger, that uh, court should look to see whether the offender formally or informally stood in a relationship to the victim that promoted confidence, reliability, and faith. And the court believes that that occurred in this particular case. So the court does believe that the uh, defendant uh, in a position of private trust. Moreover, the court believes that the defendant was a leader in this particular offense. Uh, but for him, it would not have happened. And in particular, the court believes that he is the one who could stop this incident, this incident that destroyed so many lives here. Um, in any event, the uh, court also finds with respect to mitigating factors that there are several, that the defendant did not have any prior criminal convictions, and the defendant has a lot of family and community support and he may be remorseful 
it seemed remorseful at least. But even having said that, the court believes that the enhancement factors outweigh the mitigating factors in this particular case. As such, with regard to uh, counts one through five, the court believes that the proper sentence is 17 years. With regard to counts six and seven, nine years. And we're going to count eight, two years, all of which will run concurrently with one another for a total effective sentence of 17 years. That will be the judgment of the court. Court will be in recess. All rise. On January 4, 2022, in Detroit, Jalen Brazer took the life of his cousin Zion Foster. During the prosecution's speech, shocking information was revealed. What was disclosed painted a grim picture of the incident. She made a mistake. She placed her trust in the defendant, her step-cousin, who is by all accounts her favorite cousin. But you will see that there was something off about their relationship in text messages that were unearthed in one of Zion's old phones, you will see that they communicated with each other continuously. When the defendant was 23 years old, Zion was 17 years old. They exchanged a lot of text messages that were text where the defendant shared vivid and graphic details about his life with his 17 or 16 year old cousin. You will see through these messages that he moved closer and closer into her life and that on January 4th of 2022, he took things a step further. Late that night, he brought Zion over to his house. They were alone, just the defendant's two young children were asleep upstairs. Zion left the defendant's house that night in the trunk of his car, and he threw her body away in a dumpster like she was a piece of garbage. Now, there are only two people who can say exactly what happened inside of the house that night. One of them is Zion, and she is gone. The other is the defendant, and you will hear that nearly every time he spoke about what happened, his story changed. And although he got rid of Zion's body, you will see that he left behind a trail of digital evidence that is damning and will show you that the circumstances all lead to one and only one explanation for why Zion left his house in the trunk of his car that night, and that's because he her. Now, I wanna, I wanna walk you through everything that you're gonna see and hear throughout this case, but first I wanna ask you a favor. Because Zion's body was never recovered, this is a case that required a massive investigation. And it's going to require a very meticulous and very detailed presentation over the next couple of weeks to show you the evidence that there is in this case. And so I want to ask you for your patience throughout this process. This case takes us back again to the night of January 4th of 2022. You're going to hear that that night, Zion left her home in East Point. Those closest to her, including her mother, and her boyfriend had the understanding that she was going out that night with the defendant, her cousin. And you're gonna see that Zion's last communication with anyone was very early the next morning on January 5th, at about 12.59 a.m., when she texted her boyfriend that she was on her way home. She never came home that night. She never came home the next morning. Her mother became worried, her boyfriend became worried, Worry turns to panic. And with the understanding that Zion was last with the defendant, naturally they turned to him to ask where she was. And you will hear that the defendant denied that he had been with her that night. He claimed that he had no idea where she was. But you're going to hear that Zion's boyfriend, the young man named Rutes Gonzalez, was perhaps a bit jealous that Zion had been hanging out with her older cousin that night, her older step-cousin. And you're gonna hear that Zion had location sharing enabled on her phone with her boyfriend. And you're gonna see that on Zion's last night, at 11.24 p.m., Cortez Gonzalez took a screenshot of 
Zion's phone's location, and it showed that her phone was right near the defendant's house on Greenfield Road in Detroit at 11.24 p.m. You will see that the defendant claimed, oh, she must have been down the street, or perhaps she was using his house as an alibi, he claimed. Now, eventually, the police became involved, and this started as a missing persons investigation, and the investigation started in East Point, where Zion lived, where she was reported as missing. And you're going to hear that her family quickly became frustrated with the progress in the investigation, because Zion had run away a couple of times before, and the police knew that, and she'd always come back home. And they were frustrated that the investigation wasn't being taken seriously. Eventually, the Detroit Police Department became involved. So did the Michigan State Police and the FBI. And you will see, ultimately, that these agencies collectively unturned every stone that they reasonably could to find Zion throughout this investigation. Now, one of the first things that happened when this was still a missing persons investigation was on January 6th of 2022, the day after Zion was reported missing. And you're going to see that when this was still a missing persons investigation at that time, two Detroit police officers knocked on the defendant's door and they asked him about Zion's whereabouts. This was a friendly encounter because it was still just a missing persons investigation. Um, well, what you got? Um, we were, it was just random. Like, I, from my perspective, like from my end of it. What do you mean, man? Terrified. Literally from that point on, I didn't know what to do. I wasn't the right state of mind for anything. And I turned myself and they didn't present me with anything. I after getting my thoughts together. So did you explain how she passed? I don't know exactly how she passed what caused her to pass. I just know one minute she was cool, she was fine, she laid back for a minute. Next next thing I know she's just she was, she was I don't know what caused it. I did not cause it or anything like that. I reacted stupidly off of fear and panic like I've never felt before in my life. Literally. Who? Well, I mean, people are sitting around and somebody just passes. I mean, did you think about calling 911 or something like that? No, not at the time. Um, I, we were smoking we were on marijuana as well, so my, I just, my mental state wasn't in any like logical direction, I was just immediately just terrified. Like that's the only words I can use to describe. So, it, is, it, it, are you telling me that you're stoned, she's stoned, you think she, and then you dispose of the body, just like that? That was your choice. I sat here with it and just I didn't know what to do. I was like. I just did not know what to do. It's like, I mean, the first thing that came to your mind, I'm trying to understand with the limited information I have that this person passed away in your presence and your first thought is, well, I got to get rid of the body. My first thought was how bad it looked to start with. Just like, I, how do I explain like what happened? I don't know what she happened or what it caused but, her to die. And but, a lot of possible possibilities just popped in my head and I was reacting off of just the nature, just I don't know, literally, I don't do anything, I, I just didn't know what to do, literally, I literally did not know what to do, I sat for at least 10 minutes sitting there, like what do I do, who do I call, my kids are upstairs, we just got into this place after struggling for like two years to get it, and everything is falling down. I, I won't have any conversation in this court. And I wish I could take it back. I would have called the ambulance, called her mom. Her mom's so sweet. Her mom is so sweet. And I just knew. I wish I could take it back. Nobody did in the situation. At the very least, they figured, like, okay, this happened. Confirm this. And everybody has some sort of peace right now. No. But I just didn't know what to do. That's something hey, like, in life you, you, you try to make sleep right for a lot of situations. But when one that you just would never have even thought to happen, 
just happens. And you're like, wow, immediately the first thing comes to your mind is everything about to lose, how it's going to affect your kids, your life in general. And then after that, how it's flipped when whoever, it, it, it's like play, play telephone, it changed many times. Facebook, everything, just a lie hitting me at once. So I had to just take time and try to get my thoughts together because I was on panic mode ever since that happened. Her mom at one point talked to me and I couldn't bring myself to your daughter. This what do I do? And I can't even explain it. Well, what happened? I just can tell you my honest reaction. <laughs> she just turned 17 in November. She shares her location with me everywhere she goes. She asks if she can go wherever I would allow her to go. There are yeses and there are noes. Because as a parent, you want to protect your babies. I have six kids. Zion is my oldest. All of my children look up to her. We were supposed to be planning her prom, her dress and colors. I'm still getting emails from the school right now for graduation pictures and just graduation. And now we can't do any of that because she asked me if she could go with Jalen, and I said yes, because I trust him, and I thought he would be responsible, but the fact is, is that it seems to me like he's, like he was hiding. He didn't pull up in my driveway, he pulled up in my neighbor's driveway. And he's pulled up in my driveway before. We've given each other a hug. I've spoken to him. He came that night and he picked my baby up by pulling into my neighbor's driveway and then parking in the front of my other neighbor's driveway. He called me. I didn't call him. He called me on the 5th when my baby didn't come home. He called me to say, I don't know why Zion would lie and put me into this. I haven't seen her in years. I haven't seen her in months. And I'm like, what? It wasn't too long ago that I saw you. And even knowing that my baby has been in contact with him, I kept going to his house. I just wanted him to tell me the truth. I stayed up for nights, for days, panicking and being so fearful. God, please don't let my baby be. Please, God, don't let my baby be just thrown away like she's nothing. These are the things that I prayed. I was fasting, my children not getting sleep, not eating, can't go to work. I'm a single parent. Everything that I do is for my children. Every ounce of money and time or whatever and energy is for them. It's to make sure that they're good. It's to make sure that they're surrounded by people that love them and protect them. And so, yes, Zion, you can go with your cousin who you have in your phone as Favo because he's your favorite on that side of the family. And to say, you panicked. Then why didn't you think about my baby? What if you were so high you didn't know she was alive? And you just threw her in a dumpster in the cold without a coat? And if that's the case, that means...
means that my baby was crushed in the process of how trash is taken and picked up and placed in a landfill where she will never be found. I will never know. I will never know. I won't get to see my baby again. And as far as the many times that I went to his house during the search, Your Honor, he helped me post flyers of my baby in his neighborhood on the corner of his house, the street that he lives. He told me, along with his mother, I would not lie to you. I know this has got to be really fearful for you. But I'm telling you, I have not seen her. I have not been around her. After carefully considering all the facts of the case, the judge ultimately imposed a punishment appropriate for the heinous acts committed. It is the obligation of this court in imposing sentence to consider punishment, rehabilitation, the need to protect society, as well as deterrence of my offenses, and individualized sentencing. What happened there, I have no idea. None. The demise of this poor young lady is information that I, I never will possess. Nobody will possess, quite frankly, is unique to your memory. What you did not share, what you intentionally then put this family through unnecessary trauma, uh, despair, heartache for no reason by your own admission to this court today, I knew what happened to her and I chose to conceal it, to perpetuate the false statement on this family while they participated with the falsehood that you created that she was out there somewhere. That's just incredible, absolutely incredible. I cannot do anything to remedy what occurred. I am so sorry for what has happened to you. But you need to be punished. As I indicate before each sentencing, it is the obligation of this court in imposing sentence to consider punishment, rehabilitation, the need to protect society, and deterrence from civil offenses. Your failure to be honest and truthful in preventing, I don't know, maybe preventing certainly further pain and suffering from the family, requires punishment. Uh, probation, you've recommended that he be afforded probation. That's not appropriate here. He's going to prison today. And the prison sentence here hardly reflects the injury that you've accomplished. The guidelines are appropriate, however, uh, under these circumstances, and the court will stay within the guidelines. And I am only considering the facts that are known and presented to this court and are not in dispute. Other matters that have been brought to this court's attention for which there is no basis and would require a hearing are not considered by this court. Therefore, it is the sentence of this court that Mr. Brazier, you be remanded to the custody of the Michigan Department of Corrections for a period of 23 months to four years on count one and on count two. What's his credit? 66. On count two, uh, 66 days. On uh, credit for 66 days. He's got a total of $136 state court cost, $130 crime victim right assessment, $250 circuit court cost. And Mr. Doty, your attorney fee is? 975 you're entitled to appellate review of your conviction and sentence in this matter by way of application to lead to appeal 
If you're financially unable to afford an attorney, court will appoint an attorney to represent you. You have six months from date of sentencing to request a court appointed attorney. You're being handed a form you should use if you want the court to appoint you an attorney. Do you acknowledge receipt of the form? My client has received the form, Your Honor. Bond is canceled. There's no motion. That concludes this meeting. I wish you the best, and you have to be strong for you and your family. You have been, and I know you have been, and nobody can fully appreciate what you've endured. I wish you the best. Thank you, Judge. All set, Judge? All set. Big thanks to our viewers for joining the courtroom journey with us. Your interest in the stories of justice is what keeps our channel alive.